Okay, so I think I mentioned this um, last week when I talked about upper winds. I called them winds aloft, winds at upper elevations. We actually called them geostrophic winds. We kind of talked about how um, uh, we kind of have this pressure gradient force that goes, um, we have a, what, um, we have a high pressure down here at upper elevations and a low pressure up here. So it kind of goes like this from high to low and basically elevation, or excuse me, um, deflection to the right. So that ends up making our kind of our upper westerly winds. So that's kind of what's being shown here. Geostrophic winds kind of go between isobars, which isobars at upper elevations are basically kind of along lines of, along lines of latitude, basically. Isobars, surface isobars make those cool bullseyes. Okay, but isobars at upper elevations kind of do that. Okay. So, like I said, you know, somewhere in your mind you need to kind of reconcile this, but these that I've kind of drawn on here are trade winds, are mid-latitude westerlies, are polar easterlies. Those are surface winds, okay, and we have, we have basically a westerly wind going up here. Um, we kind of talked, I think, in the previous chapter about the force of friction is most significant at the Earth's surface. Okay, as you get farther from the Earth's surface, less friction, and so it goes faster and faster and faster as it um, gets to the stratosphere, and then it starts to slow down. So kind of talking about those upper westerly winds. I'm just kind of switching gears from the, you know, the surface winds. So those upper westerly winds, well, they don't always go line up between lines um, of latitude, okay? Sometimes those um, upper westerly winds can actually kind of take kind of a sort of um, what we call meander, kind of go up and down and up and down. Now the other thing we need to talk about in upper elevation are these two jet streams. So it's kind of neat that the two jet streams, and we're going to have a picture here in a minute, but we have actually four jet streams, two in each hemisphere. We have a jet stream generally right here, that is your uh, subtropical jet, okay? And then we have a jet right here, and that's your polar jet. So those are up, upper elevations kind of going around the Earth. I say they go around the Earth, but if you've ever kind of watched hot air ballooners, okay, there's been times when they're counting on that jet stream, which is basically a fast ribbon of, of uh, moving air, to kind of get them from point A to point B. But if sometimes the, the jet stream actually has breaks in it, and it can leave them stranded. So we have these two jet streams. So the top jet stream, actually in the northern hemisphere, the bottom jet stream in the southern hemisphere. So we have a jet stream here, subtropical jet, jet stream here, polar jet, kind of between the cells in the southern hemisphere too. Um, here's a little bit about the polar jet stream. So kind of starting with the polar jet stream, it's between the feral cell and the Hadley cell. But the other thing I want to talk about between the polar cell and the feral cell is what we call the polar front. Now, um, in chapter 9, which is the last chapter for Unit 3, in chapter 9 we'll finally start to talk about weather fronts. And one of the things I think we've looked at just briefly is, you know, on a surface map, if you have a blue line with triangles, okay, that's going to be your cold front. If you have a red line with semicircles, that's going to be your warm front. So what a front is, and we won't get told to tonight, but what a front is, is basically you have two chunks of air with differing conditions. And so this actually is a front because we have cool air, part of the uh, polar cell, and warm air, part of the, the feral cell. Okay, and they clash and create that polar front. And we'll actually kind of come back to the polar front. Okay. So the polar jet stream is more of a player for us. And I get this mixed up, but the polar jet stream um, like I said, is more of a player. Sometimes it's actually called the mid-latitude jet stream. And there is a good example. The color there is actually showing you the fast-moving air. So this is a good example. You kind of can see the polar jet stream kind of disconnected. So if you're like a hot air balloonist and you end up up here, you're like, oh, man, I need to keep going this way. You like, run, out of, run out of air. So the polar jet stream actually will... Um, migrate north in the summertime and south or towards the um, or south in the winter time. So okay. 
So um, the polar jet stream is more of a player. The subtropical jet stream, not, not as much for us in general. So the subtropical jet stream is between the Hadley and the feral cell. It's weaker. When I see these uh, fast moving ribbons of, of air, I think of the um, like Finding Nemo and the turtle that found the, <laughs> the fast moving water. Yep. Okay. So um, we have these geostrophic winds, kind of upper elevation winds going between isobars, which may be like lines of latitude. But um, if there is a little bit of gyration in those upper level winds, they create what we call Rossby waves with a soft S. And you can kind of see, trace out the Rossby waves if you find the jet stream. And wherever the jet stream is, that's kind of how the Rossby waves are. So like this says, you can actually have kind of three to six cycles go around the Earth at a given time. The Rossby wave, you figure if this is a kink, if this is a wave, I mean, it's really big. <laughs> it, it takes a long time to move on, and it kind of takes a long time to malform. So they, they kind of hang around for a while. So up here uh, at the top, you can kind of see the cold air, kind of maybe that's the polar cell going all the way around, bumping up against the feral cell. Um, and the jet stream is what's kind of right over the intersection. So it's kind of between the, the cold, look, it's kind of between the cold and the warmer air. So if in general, now this is in north, this is in the northern hemisphere, if you're above the, I'll go ahead and put a little X there, if you are above the jet stream, okay, you are generally going to be cold and maybe stormy. If you are below the jet stream, you should be at least warm, if not warm and dry. So um, we do kind of count on the jet stream kind of moving along. Actually, I say moving along, but also kind of carrying its, um, oops, sorry, go back. Also carrying its uh, meandered form around. Okay, we do kind of count on it moving. So we have these couple of options with regard to the jet stream. If it's like, uh, I kind of think of football here, I don't know, the zone, like, I don't know. But if it's like straight, we call that zonal flow. If it's wavy, we call that meridional flow. So meridional flow would be kind of like a north, south, north, south. Okay, the whole Rossby wave would be a meridional flow. Zonal flow, not so much. And we'll have different um, weather patterns based upon, again, this is upper elevations, and this is some of the reason why um, forecasting, um, predicting what the weather's going to be is so hairy, because it does make a difference what's going on up here. So in general, if it's straight, zonal flow, no kinks, okay, um, we're going to kind of have mild weather. If it's meridional, you're going to have kind of alternating, warm, cold, warm, cold. So with a uh, kind of a wavy meridional, kind of the Rossby waves, um, a lot of times you'll see, remember we talked about ridges and troughs? Okay, we're kind of coming back to that idea of ridges and troughs. With ridges, you're going to kind of see an H there. With troughs, you're going to see an L there. Um, the H's are, we, talked, we call them anticyclones. And actually, last week we talked about anticyclones generally bring clear weather. Okay. Um, lows are, can bring us our clouds and precipitation. So I'm going to show you this pinching off phenomenon on the next slide, what that looks like. Basically, if you have it wavy enough, you can go ahead and take a segment and it can pinch off and move one direction or the other. In this case, um, I'm going to show you basically um, a segment of cold air gets pinched off from the rest of its cold air and gets and moves south. So the way you look at this figure, you start here, then you go here, then you go here, and then you go here. 
Okay, so again, we kind of have the, the, the difference between the colors there um, would be our polar, um, polar jet stream right there. Um, and so we have a little bit of waviness here, but even more waviness here. This kink right here actually is what's going to pinch off. You can kind of see it pinching off over here, pinching off over here. We're going to talk about air masses in the next chapter. And this is like uh, its own little air mass kind of sent on its way. It, like it had a baby. That's kind of what it looks like. Okay. Now, this actually, if you've heard of an Arctic, um, Arctic break, or, um, Arctic um, air mass influence, that's actually probably what that is. Cold. All right. So, um, global winds and ocean currents. So, and I didn't bring my thing, but that's okay. We have some figures. I didn't bring my ball. But, um, so the only reason we have ocean currents, well, we have tides because of the moon, okay? Um, but we have big old ocean currents because of the way the wind is moving over the water. And it uses friction. It's kind of neat. I've looked into a little bit. Actually, our ocean currents are mostly on the surface. If you get below the bunch of the surface, it's all still and creepy. So, um, but those surface ocean currents are due to the wind um, making that happen. So here in a minute, when we look at ocean currents, kind of look for those semi-permanent highs here, where remember the Bermuda High was one of those kind of between the Hadley and the Feral Cell, and it, uh, winds will be going clockwise around those, and the semi-permanent lows between the Feral and the Polar Cell, and winds will be going, um, did I say clockwise? So they'll be going clockwise around our highs and counterclockwise around our lows in the Northern Hemisphere. All right. So just to kind of remind you, this is not ocean currents yet. This is just winds, or kind of just... Yeah, kind of winds. So, of course, the purple is the wandering intertropical convergence zone. This is um, in July. The top one's in January. Okay, so let's see if we can match up some of these kind of prevailing winds around the semi-permanent highs, semi-permanent lows on the next slide. Okay, so this is a simpler one, just kind of showing you um, major ocean currents. So the currents kind of add together to create what we call ocean gyres. So the ocean basin has a number of currents that add together to, to create it. But if we go ahead and put an H here, okay, semi-permanent high, let's see if it follows our rule of going clockwise. It does. High here, clockwise. Okay. Um, southern hemisphere, high here goes counterclockwise, counterclockwise, and it totally is. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that's consistent with what we've been talking about. So when it talks about the five major ocean gyres, let's see if we can come up with them. We're going to be referring to over here as the North Pacific Ocean Gyre. Okay, this would be the South Pacific Ocean Gyre, the North Atlantic Ocean Gyre, the South Atlantic Ocean Gyre, and the Indian Ocean Gyre. So that's kind of what we got going on. Okay, so one of the last topics here I'm going, I want to get into is the El Nino La Nina sort of thing. So just to kind of give you a heads up, the big picture. Um, there is this phenomenon called upwelling, and upwelling is just kind of an ongoing sort of deal. Um, the example that we're going to look at, in order to understand El Nino, La Nina, we're going to spend a little bit of time. So sometimes I tell students you might want to, if you don't have a globe, go out and buy one. Get your, get your favorite map handy. Let's see where to go. Okay, so we have North America, South America. So actually the whole El Nino, La Nina event thing, we're going to kind of focus on see Peru, okay, and see... Um, is this New Zealand versus Australia? Oh, duh. Okay. <laughs> All right, good. Okay, so find Peru and find Australia. We're going to be talking about those guys. So with upwelling, let's go ahead and pick on Peru. Um, we said that um, basically we have an ocean current going... Hey, 
think so, because it's going clockwise around a high. Uh, no, nope, counterclockwise. Okay, final answer. So it's going counterclockwise around a high and clockwise around a high up here. That's better. Okay, so we hit down Peru. Okay, so we have water coming up, and like this is saying, it kind of comes up against the coast from the ocean gyre. This would be the South Pacific, right? And actually, with, ocean, with um, upwelling, we kind of have an outgoing current at the beaches, Okay, and that outgoing current keeps, and I can't go underneath there, <laughs> I'm trying to go underneath the water, but basically water kind of can come up and out, okay, along the coast. Now, like this slide says, the significance of upwelling is you have all sorts of kind of green things that are growing down here. It's not very deep, okay, so basically we have nice nutrient-rich waters coming up to feed the little organisms here. So if, if things are working and we have our easterly trade winds doing their easterly trade things, um, okay, uh, we definitely have a little bit of upwelling going on. So upwelling is good. Fishermen like upwelling. Okay, an example of upwelling I kind of showed you with Peru. Um, then it happens in California too. So um, I told you kind of already where to focus if you do get a map or whatever, a globe. You need to find South America, and you need to find Australia, and it's a far piece from each other, farther than I thought. There's Australia, and there's South America, okay? And that's kind of this neck of the woods. It's pretty big. Um, I don't have it in my notes, but if you're looking for to cross-reference it, this thing right here looks like 3D, doesn't it? This actually is sometimes called the Walker cell. Walker cell. So basically, it's something kind of like we've talked about before. And notice this slide is called normal years. Now, I'm, like I said, I'm gearing up for El Nino, La Nina, sort of. So this is normal years. Okay, you have your upwelling. That's kind of shown right here. This is, this is upwelling. One of the things about upwelling is it uh, brings nutrient-rich water and it also has like a cooling effect to these guys in South America and to... Um, California. But according to the normal flow of things, the Walker cell says basically um, you're going to have um, kind of cooler, dish, cooler conditions here and basically your, um, your warm, moist air is going to go that way. It's going to kind of bunch up around Australia. It's going to rise. It's going to cool as it rises. It's going to be nice and moist. You're going to have, it's basically going to dump water on Australia. Sometimes they call this like Indonesia. I've heard it kind of described both. Okay, so that's normal. Notice they talk about the Peruvian current. If you go back a few slides, you can actually kind of see where the Peruvian current is. Peru.c. So that's kind of what we're talking about. So let's pick on El Nino first. Okay, so here we go. El Nino. Little boy. So this is the same neck of the woods. We have uh, Peru, we have Australia. Okay. Um, but notice that if you compare the previous slide with this slide, now we basically have a high pressure over here and a low pressure over here. We, we have wind going like this. Now, I refer you to what well, we talked about, the prevailing wind. You're like, dude, that's like going opposite of our easterly trades. It's like a westerly wind, and actually that's one of the characteristics of an El Nino year. It can last like 10 years or so, and I have a figure from your textbook that says what can you expect when, and how do I describe this? It's like a global thing, like they'll say our planet is experiencing El Nino, but this is where they look, okay? It has all sorts of consequences. That's the best way I know to, to explain it. So what it does then, and it's kind of highlighted on the slide, what it does is it makes these guys dry, okay? Remember they used to get a bunch of rain. And it makes these guys wet. They used to be drier. And basically it kills the upwelling. So those poor little fishies and, and uh, fishermen who wanted to get the fishies are in, in trouble, okay? So that's El Nino. Shuts down upwelling. Um, the water is now warm and nutrient poor off of the Peruvian area, uh, west coast of South America. Um, 
The folks at the other end of the walker cell, okay, Australia, Indonesia, they don't get the rain. Actually, what I've read is in an El Nino year, you can have a stick. You can have a stick. Um, this is in a year. <laughs> and you'll see the water levels go down. Sea levels will go down because they're not getting precipitation. Okay. So, I don't know. What are you going to do, right? So, like I said, um, your figure, your textbook has a couple of good figures that basically said, what can you expect? And I think they break it out for summer and winter if you have an El Nino in place. And I think we are just, I think one of the students uh, pointed out too, we are leaving El Nino entering La Nina, which don't usually last as long, I don't think. So here's the El Nino event again. Okay, we generally have, like the slide says, you know, we talked about if this, if this is kind of wind, okay, we know it's going from a high to a low. Um, and notice that if these are supposed to be easterly trade winds, you're like, dude, that's not easterly, <laughs> okay? So they peter out or even reverse themselves. They're shown here. So now if we compare that with La Nina, this one is La Nina. La Nina kind of looks like normal, if you ask me. This is La Nina, okay? It looks like normal. Again, we have our easterly trade winds, but notice they're extra strong, okay? So if they're extra strong, then actually um, these guys are going to be wetter than usual, okay? They're usually wet, but they're wetter than usual, and we're going to have a crazy amount of upwelling going, um, upwelling, excuse me, going on there. Um, if you have a lot of upwelling, this is going to be cooler than usual over here, probably drier than usual, drier. That's La Nina. So the going back and forth, El Nino, La Nina, is called the Southern Oscillation. So let's see, I didn't go here yet today, so let's see if it'll take us out. So as you might imagine, they keep track of these things. The Farmer's Almanac, I usually get one every year. And, um, of course, they predict what kind of summer you're going to have, what kind of winter you're going to have. They're not bad. And one of the factors they use is what sort of pattern are we in with regard to El Nino, La Nina. Is it still coming up? Let's see. So it says El Nino Advisory. Now, where it says SST... And I don't know if you've watched the movie The Day After Tomorrow, but the movie The Day After Tomorrow kind of, um, one of its themes is the folks here in Greenland. Remember, I think like that one dude like dies. But the folks here in Greenland, one of the things that they're doing is watching sea surface temperatures. So they have buoys out here, and the movie goes like, that's a good player. So sea surface temperatures actually can tell us um, which event we're in, because like I just said, if you have a buoy off of here, Okay, if it's La Nina, it's going to be cold, right? If you have a buoy off here and it's El Nino, it's going to be warmer than usual. Let's see what this does. That isn't what I wanted. That may not be able to show what I was hoping. Well, I'll just go back to the PowerPoint if I can. All right, I'll show it. To, I'll show you. It won't be the current um, southern oscillation cycle, but it will be, you know. So um, La Nina then is the somewhat the opposite of El Nino. The what we say is the easterly trade winds don't reverse themselves or peter out like an El Nino, but in a La Nina they actually intensify. So we have an extra dose of precipitation coming over to Australia and Indonesia. Um, the South America, Peru area will be even drier. So, yeah. So um, down here when it says tropical cyclone activity enhanced, if in your notes you want to put hurricane, you can. And sometimes I forget which way it goes, but I must have looked it up, so I did this. This is hurricane. So if we are entering an 
La Nina, and I'll try to double check that for next week from an El Nino, then that's one of the factors in hurricane season. You know, they always come out with, oh, what's the hurricane season going to be like? And I believe um, El Nino favors then the inland severe weather, which of course is tornadoes. So, all right. So here's some figures from your textbook. This is if you have an El Nino in place, if we just kind of find um, where we are. Here we are, kind of over here-ish. Okay, this is in um, December to February. Okay, and not much going on there from June to August. And if you're like me, you're like, well, what happens from August to December and February to June? And I don't know. That's El Nino. It's a, glo it's a global thing. And this is La Nina. And you see we do get a little bit in, um, in our winter months. We can be a little warmer and drier. La Nina. Okay. So, um... These figures are sea surface temperatures, and I said that's one of the things that they look at. So, of course, the red is hot and the uh, blue or black is cold. So, if you actually have um, warmer temperatures than usual, then that means your um, that means that your upwelling is shut down. And if your upwelling is shut down, um, anomaly warmer than. Looks like these look backwards to me. La Nina is cold. Does it seem right? I'll have to double check that. These seem backwards to me. Because I would think that your La Nina would be warmer in your... No, no, okay. I say, I take that back. Sorry. El Nino, yeah. Your upwelling is shut down. I said it right. If, but if your upwelling is shut down, it is warmer. It's right. And if your upwelling is increased with a La Nina, then it's going to be colder. All right, it is right. I don't have to fix that one anyway. So this is what I was trying to kind of look for and kind of show you, like the current one. Um, basically, the reds are um, El Nino and the blues are La Nina. So you can kind of see how it's gone back and forth um, over the last several years. So I kind of want to end with this idea of um, uh, precipitation, uh, annual precipitation. Where, what gets the precipitation? Um, in general, if you kind of have a semi-permanent high, you're generally going to have um, dry conditions. Semi-permanent low is usually wet. Okay. So with that in mind, we kind of have some lows that are wet. Okay and some highs that are dry. So we are going to, in Unit 5 in here, there's no Unit 5 exam, but we are going to talk about climates a little bit. And so we're going to find our, our, uh, our wet climates are going to potentially be here, okay? Um, and our dry climates are potentially going to be here. But it's not that simple. Notice the word idealized again. So we're going to kind of see what it really ends up being on the next slide. The other thing on the next slide when we look at kind of annual precipitation is we see an effect of um, continents versus um, large oceans and kind of if there is a mountain, the windward side gets more precipitation than the leeward side of the mountain. So this is what it, what it generally runs through the year, throughout the year. So the darker the blue, the more the precipitation. So you can kind of maybe see the intertropical convergent zone kind of going along there. Um, kind of see some dry regions after the Hadley cell into kind of, or between the Hadley and the Farrell cell. But it's just not that simple. So one of the things that your textbook did talk about is that we generally see on the western sides of continents, okay, they're generally drier than the eastern sides. And this is because of the, the way those semi-permanent highs, like that looks maybe like the Bermuda high, Generally, what it will do is uh, bring moist air and dump it here, whereas over here, it kind of brings cold, drier air and going clockwise. So 
which actually we do generally see that our, you know, if you go out and visit this area, it's drier and this is wetter. Cool, and that's it. So let's take another break. Um, hopefully be just more like 10 minutes this time. And then we'll come back for chapter eight.